buenos días a todos. Eh, vamos a proceder al acto de defensa de la tesis de don Víctor González Pacheco, Interactive and Active Learning in Social Robot, eh, dirigida por mm, los doctores Miguel Ángel Salit Sánchez y María de los Ángeles Malfaz. Eh, la secretaria procederá a leer la normativa vigente. Bueno, pues voy a proceder a, a leer los artículos eh, que se aplican a, esta, a este acto de defensa, empezando por el artículo 14.4, que dice «La tesis doctoral se evaluará en el acto de defensa que tendrá lugar en sesión pública y consistirá en la exposición y defensa por el doctorando del trabajo de investigación elaborado ante los miembros del tribunal. Los doctores presentes en el acto público podrán formular cuestiones en el momento y forma que señale el presidente del tribunal». Y el artículo 14.7, que dicta «El tribunal emitirá un informe y la calificación global concedida a la tesis de acuerdo con la siguiente escala. No apto, aprobado, notable y sobresaliente. El tribunal podrá proponer la mención de cum laude si la calificación global es de sobresaliente y se emite en tal sentido el voto secreto positivo por unanimidad». La universidad habilitará los mecanismos precisos para la materialización de la concesión final de dicha mención, garantizando que el escrutinio de los votos para dicha concesión se realice en sesión diferente de la correspondiente a la de defensa de la tesis doctoral. ¿Vale? Puede comenzar. Muchas gracias. Okay, thank you and good morning. This thesis is uh, about uh, how to mix techniques from human robot interaction and machine learning so we can make robots uh, to learn better from people. I'll try, to, I'll try to keep the same structure here in this presentation as in the manuscript, with the exception of the, of the active learning theoretical aspects, which I omitted here for the sake of time. Uh, so I will start with a brief introduction explaining uh, our motivations and the objectives of, the, of, this, uh, of this work. And later on, I will enter in the, in the core aspects in the in the contributions that we have made during this, uh, these four years. Uh, first, we'll explain the, the, the contributions in the, in the field of uh, interactive learner, learning, and afterwards, I, I will go for uh, the active learning aspects of the, of the thesis. So, let's go for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to show you a video, which is a video from a TV series, uh, which I think that it reflects perfectly what is the problem or how uh, we think in the HRI community that a robot, or why we think in the HRI community that robots should be able to learn from people and to learn at all. <laughs> and now the Kung Pao chicken. I <laughs> and it's food. <laughs> and finally, my Mushu pork. entire dinner unpacked by robot. <laughs> and it only took 28 minutes. This is one of the problems that they hey, have. food here? Ooh, what's that? That, dear lady, is the Wallowitz programmable ham. Oh, cool. Ask me to pass the soy sauce. All right, pass the soy sauce. Coming up. <clears throat> and here we have the second problem. Okay, here we go. Passing the soy sauce. Okay, put out your hand. Oh, that's amazing. So, for us it's clear that robots need to learn. And which is the inspiration from, of which is the inspiration, the, the way these robots should learn? Uh, I think Robots should learn like that. This is an example from uh, a very old TV series in which uh, some uh, puppets were teaching some concepts to, to children. Hello there, this is your old pal Grover. Mm -hmm. And today I'm going to talk to you about near and far. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, little furry Grover, am going to show you near and far. Mm -hmm. Okay, here goes. <coughs> First, this is near. Right here. Near. Mm -hmm. This is far. This is near. Uh, you see? Huh? Oh, okay. I'll do one more for you, okay? Okay. So, 
our inspirations come from here. So we want to apply uh, this kind of learning from in, in robots. And there is a field in, in machine learning which uh, it's very, very similar to, to the way that uh, children uh, learn, which is I show you some, uh, some concept and I tell you which concept it is. Uh, and this is called uh, supervised learning. So our idea in this thesis is we are going to apply supervised technique f uh, techniques uh, in, in, in robot learning and we will apply this learning in not learning skills, but uh, learning concepts uh, or making enabling robots to learn concepts. But there are many challenges that we have uh, that they are not yet solved. Uh, and the ones that uh, we want to try to solve are reflected here in, in, in this slide. The first one is interaction during learning. Generally, interaction during human robot learning uh, is very simple. It's just basing some very simple commands and very simple rules, and we want them to improve this. The other one is how we make robots to acquire labels. Robots have lots of sensors, and sometimes it's very costly to, to, to label what the robot is seeing or what the robot is perceiving. And there are a couple more uh, challenges that uh, we believe that uh, we wanted to solve here in this thesis. The first one is deciding when to finish the, the training. In supervised learning, generally, what we have is a human provides a data set to the robot, the robot explores this data set, learns from this data set, and that's enough. The training has finished. And this data set might be not enough for the robot, might be too much data for the robot, and what we want to, to achieve is to have a robot that decides how much training does it need. And the last one is uh, there is very few work in the literature uh, trying to address the problem of enable, enabling robots to detect new concepts. What happens if I show something to a robot that has never been able to see? Will be the robot able to detect that this is something that it doesn't know? Will be the robot able to ask to the human, hey, what are you doing right now? And we want to solve this challenge, and, and this is one of the objectives of the thesis. The great or the big objective of this thesis is to develop a system that enables a, robot, a social robot to learn interactively and in a natural way. And by a natural way, we mean something similar as we have seen in the example uh, in the video before. This big objective can be split up in smaller ones, uh, which I listed here. First, first of all, we want to improve or we want to provide some kind of a natural learning, and that will imply some multimodal learning. So the uh, trainer or the teacher of the robot will not only use or won't use only voice, but other modalities like uh, some poses, etc. The second objective is to apply active learning uh, to learn new concepts, and is is written in the in the manuscript. And the the reason of using active learning here, I'm going to tell you that just is a a way of improving the speed of robot learning and the way of uh, improving the the performance of the of the robot learner. And also, also uh, active learning will enable us to have robot driven, what we call robot-driven learning. Robot-driven learning, for us, is let the robot decide how much training does it need and enable the robot to detect new concepts, as I, as I told you before. And a final objective that ha we have in this, uh, in this uh, work was also, uh, was also um, apply this, uh, these ideas in, in different domains. So we applied it in pose and object recognition. There are some related work to our thesis. Uh, regarding the interaction aspects of, uh, of learning, as I said, there's uh, usually people that uh, enable robots or, or, or do some interaction during learning. They focus on the learning aspects and not in, in, the, in the interactions. And However, there are some works that uh, are similar to us. Uh, this one from Bripsky, they used a uh, dialogue system to, to, to teach the robot like uh, we are doing here. But uh, this interaction was targeted, was targeted to describe tasks instead of concepts that we are doing here, uh, unless, uh, unlike we are doing in, in our thesis. And I think I personally think that the biggest contributions of our thesis is also in uh, they are also in uh, uh, in active learning, and as I said before, most of these of these ideas of active learning are applying to enable robots to learn some skills like uh, grabbing a cup of coffee, uh, doing some uh, uh, movements, etc., etc. 
However, there are some people that have worked uh, with uh, teaching the robot some concepts. Uh, there are not so many people that have uh, teach the robot for some concepts, sorry. Uh, mainly from uh, Rosenthal and, and Kakmak, and Kakmak, which are the, the main inspiration for our active learning in, in this thesis. Both of these works focused in the, uh, or, or realized that the way a robot asks questions to the user might affect how that user responds, answers to these questions, but they stopped here. What we wanted to do is, okay, we know that depending on how the robot asks the question will impact uh, on the answer, but what is the impact of this answer into robot learning? And this is one of the contributions that we did here. There is also some contributions in the in novelty detection area in which uh, we believe that we are the first ones or uh, in using uh, these novelty detection techniques mixed with human robot interaction just to let the robot to know which concepts doesn't need to ask to the user and which concepts are unknown to the, uh, to the, to the robot. Actually, there is very, very, very few literature on novelty detection in robotics. And some of them are, for instance, uh, this work from, from Dreus in 2013, which was targeted uh, to video surveillance. And mainly all the novelty detection approaches that are in robotics are not novelty detection, but anomaly detection to detect failures in the, in the robot or in the, in the system. <laughs> there is uh, one work, which is from Pinto, which tried to address the idea of uh, gaps of, uh, or trying to address the problem of having gaps in the robot knowledge. And this, uh, this work with Pinto is similar to us in the sense that uh, the robot that detected these gaps, but it was for room semantics acquisition. So about, uh, it was to get knowledge about a, a room in which the robot was operating. One of the main differences between uh, Pinto and, and our works is that uh, we focus a bit into differentiating between noise and novel data. They didn't, they didn't address this difference, and, and we are addressing it. So that was for the introduction. Let's go for the core contributions of our thesis. So we'll start in interactive learning and learning poses. This was our first approach to robot learning, and the objective of this uh, experiment and, and this contribution was to endow a social robot with interactive learning capabilities. We used our robot Maggie, it's a robot that we made in our own lab, and it's equipped by, with a Kinect in her belly, with some speakers around uh, her neck, and we communicate with the robot with an external microphone. So with these sensorial inputs, we, have, uh, we get the, what the user is telling to the robot using an automatic speech recognition system, uh, which extracts the label of what the, robot, of what the robot is seeing. What is the robot sees? What the, ro what the robot sees? Well, so we use the Kinect and we extract we using a third-party libraries the skeleton, a skeleton model of the user adopting some pose. We couple each data instance with a label, and with that uh, we, may, uh, we make a, a data set of, of poses. This data set is later fed to a machine learning algorithm like a SBM, a random forest, etc. And with that we can build a model. So in the exploitation phase, we load this model to a pose classifier, and we try to predict what the user is, uh, what pose is adopting the user, and we tell it to the to the user using a TTS, a text-to-speech system. This is an overview of the whole system, and this is the the model of the skeleton that uh, we retrieve from the Kinect. It's a model with 15 joints, and each joint is providing us uh, seven parameters for uh, representing the orientation, uh, the position, and the orientation of each joint of the skeleton. One of the interesting things of this work is uh, the grammar-based interaction that we build for, uh, for this learning. We use two different grammars. A grammar is a set of rules in which we can communicate with a robot using uh, conveying the same semantic meaning, semantic meaning with different sentences. We use two different grammars, one to control the training session and the other to tell the robot which pose we were adopting. Here you have an example of uh, how to convey the same pose definition. And, uh, 
three examples of how to control the session. So uh, with the control of session was uh, just uh, let's start recording some poses, uh, stop recording, and the session, etc., etc. This is the the experimental setup that we have. We draw a rectangle in the in the area in which the user was uh, able to move freely around this area, just to be sure that uh, the Kinect was uh, sorry the user was always it was always always inside the field of view of the Kinect. We used uh, we trained the system with 24 users, and each user trained the robot with nine different poses, as you can see here in these examples. Three for turn, three different directions in turn, three dif different directions in looking, and where he was pointing. Here you have an example of the pointing. Mari, vamos a grabar poses. Vale, ponte en la pose que quieras enseñarme y dime el nombre de esa pose. Estoy apuntando a la izquierda. Estoy apuntando hacia adelante. Vale. Estoy apuntando hacia la derecha. Ok. Déjalo ya. Vale, dejamos de aprender poses. And this is the exploitation phase. The robot is detecting vale, what pose I am going to So these are the results for, for this experiment, uh, for the turn, looking, and pointing experiment, uh, data sets. And in the turn, the data was, uh, when you saw the data, uh, this data was linearly separable very easily, so the classifiers got uh, very, very high performance. It was a very trivial example. Not for the looking and the pointing experiment, uh, but with uh, the 23 users, uh, we were able to to, to achieve a F, F, F1 score around 80%, depending on the algorithm. The looking experiment got worse performance compared to the pointing experiment because the Kinect is providing less resolution for the head uh, compared to the hands. So, to conclude this experiment, uh, we were able to build a system that enabled the robot to learn in real time and while interacting with the user. And this interaction was led by a grammar-based interaction, which it provides some sort of flexibility because we could write some certain rules. But in the end, it was limiting because the number of poses that we can teach the robot was not limited by the learning algorithms, but the grammar. We had to, to write, uh, to pre-code in the grammars the poses that the user was going to teach, and this is a lim uh, limiting factor. So, as we'll see later, we came up with a solution to, to overcome this problem. This work uh, was published in a conference and in a journal paper, in a sensor paper, in a sensor journal. So that was for learning poses. Let's go for learning objects. The idea of this experiment was, okay, we, we are able to, to teach a uh, robot in real time. Let's try to do it in a different domain. And this domain was handheld object, uh, object recognition. The system is quite similar to the previous one, with the exception that here we are not only using the, the skeleton model of the Kinect, we are also extracting the point cloud and the RGB image. With that, uh, with that data, we use the, uh, with the skeleton, we try to locate the, the user hand. Once we have the user hand, we crop a region of interest area around this hand. And we crop the point cloud around this hand, and we crop the the, the RGB image around this hand. So later on in the future extraction uh, phase, we can accelerate the process because it's a smaller area uh, of, uh, of searching. We aggregate the 2D free features from the RGB image and the 3D features from the point cloud, and we build a data set. The exploitation uh, phase is quite similar, with the exception, uh, at least the, the data acquisition system is uh, exactly the same. And what we do here is, okay, we compare the the features that we are extracting against the data set. So this is a very simple uh, future matching problem. 
and we call it this system, the ocular system. As you might have noticed, uh, there is no speech interaction in this learning, and the, the control of the, of the learning session was by just the pose of the user. So extending the arm, meaning that I'm showing something to you that I want you to learn, other different poses with the arm uh, uh, folded, means that the road has to recognize what it's seeing. So we carry out an experiment in which we train the system with uh, six different objects, and we train it with one, five, and ten views per object. By a, me by a view, I mean something like that. Here you have two examples of uh, two different objects with four different views. Those are the results for one, five, and ten views for the F1 score. And as you can see, we achieve with ten views per object an F score of uh, around 80%. One interesting aspect that, uh, of this experiment is that we combine, uh, to, to make the predictions, we combine the features from the RGB image and from the pan cloud, and combining them, uh, we were able to improve the, the overall uh, F-score of the system. Notice as well that uh, the pan cloud work quite worse compared to the, Kinect, to the RGB images, but however, uh, the system was able to, uh, to improve the, the overall performance when combining them. The reason that, uh, because uh, the point cloud was quite, uh, or, or the, the RGB image performed quite better than compared to the point cloud, is I, we believe it is because of the resolution of the point cloud uh, at, the, at the distance. So, in conclusion, uh, we were able to build this system as well in real time, thanks to the cropping of the region of interest and also uh, combining the, the, the both matchers, uh, we were able to improve the, per the, the final performance. That was for learning objects. Let's go for the active learning. I'm starting by poses. So our motivation here was, what happens when the robot asks the human some question? And what the human is providing, what the human is answering to the robot is a correct answer, but is omitting some information that might be useful for the robot. So it's an inaccurate answer. So we wanted to study how these inaccuracies from the user answers might affect the robot learning. And we studied in the domain of post recognition. In active learning, there are many kinds of questions that the robot can ask to the user. Some of them, there are feature queries, which are asking for certain aspects, for certain parameters of the learning space of the robot. Like, is this arm important for knowing this uh, current pose? Is it not uh, relevant or yes? Um, so here we have three different examples that we came up, uh, sorry, we came up with three different uh, categories for feature queries, which are free speech queries, yes no queries, and rank queries. Here you can see different examples of each one. In free speech queries, the user can answer freely. Yes, no queries are expecting a yes or no for an answer. And rank queries, they are similar somehow to the yes, no queries, but instead of a blunt yes or no, you expect some rating of what uh, the robot is asking. Sorry. So the idea is by asking several questions to the user, we can get an idea of how important was each limb uh, in to detect some certain poses. So the idea is, okay, now that we know how important, how relevant are the each, uh, each uh, body part, we can uh, build a threshold around, uh, uh, we can build a threshold so we can filter the, the features, so we can filter the, the, the body parts that are relevant for this problem. So for example, if for a pointing gesture many people has told to the robot that the hand and the elbow are very important, what we are going to do is we will filter out uh, all the joints that are not important for this problem. And we get the left elbow and the left hand. And we carry out an experiment which uh, was similar to the previous one, 24 users teaching nine poses in a, in a similar area. And here we have the the different answers that the user uh, got uh, replied to the robot uh, for the free speech queries, yes, no queries, and run queries. Here you have all the limbs of the skeleton model, and in orange are the limbs or the body parts that have been past this, this threshold. So are the body parts that will be fed to the, to the learning algorithm later. 
These are for the looking experiment, where most of the users told the robot that the head and the neck are quite important or relevant. And in the case of the pointing, the user selected the arms. So everything OK until we got the results. In green and in red, you can see our uh, active learning filters for free speech queries and run queries. And as you can see, in blue, we have a passive learner. And it was happening here. When, when we saw these results, is the passive learners were working better than the active learners, just the opposite, the opposite that we were expecting. And that got, got us completely by surprise. We weren't expecting these kind of results. Why the active learners were working worse than the active learners? Sorry, the passive learners. And that was puzzling, puzzling bec because when we look to the pointing experiment, the active learners work as expected. So at the beginning, we thought that we were wrong. We made some kind of mistakes. So we go back to the data. We analyze the user answers. We analyze the data. We, see, we saw the videos. And we realized that the, the problem was uh, not in our site. But what was happening is, OK, the users were providing some inaccuracies to the robot when they answering. What happened is in the, in the looking experiment, most of the users were telling to the robot, my head is important, my neck is important. But when we saw the videos, what we saw was, OK, the, the users, when they're looking, they move slightly the, the shoulders. And this, is, this information was omitted to the active learners. So the, the active learners was trying to learn with less data than the passive learners. The passive learners look to the data of the shoulders, realize that it's important, and use it. And that's because uh, they got better performance. So <coughs> after realizing of, of this fact, what we did is, OK, we need a solution for that because Active learning, we know that active learning is good for robotics, accelerated learning improves learning. But there is a problem that we don't know when it's going to happen. We don't know when the user is going to be inaccurate with us. So what do we have to do? Is it possible to overcome this problem? And what we did is, OK, I'm going to ask you, but I'm going to trust you, but I'm not going to trust you so much. I'm, I'm going to get your answers, but uh, I'm going to get them with a pinch of salt. So what we build is the extended filter. Here you have an example. Most of the users selected the head and the neck. And the robot, because was not trusting so much to the, to the user, it also incorporated the adjacent limbs. What are the results of that? OK, here we have, in purple, the results of the extended filter. And as you can see in the looking experiment, behave at least as well as a passive learner are, depending on the algorithm, even better. OK, when the user is providing some good data, uh, uh, inaccuracy, inaccurate answers, the uh, extended filter is, work is working better than the active learners. What happens when the user is accurate? Well, the extended filter behaves as an active learner. So we got best of two worlds. So in conclusion, uh, we realize that uh, using Active Learner, we can have some inaccuracy from the user, which might reduce the model accuracy. And we build a, an approach, or we build a system, uh, which is the extended filter. We call the extended filter that mitigates this, at least in our, in our domain. This work uh, has been published in a couple of conference uh, in a couple of conferences, and we are under review in a journal paper. That was for uh, for learning poses. So let's go to learn objects with active learning. The objective of this uh, of this experiment was to improve the uh, our ocular system that I told you before by adding some active learning and also improving the the interaction that we have here. We use the the Mbot. The Mbot is a robot that we acquired uh, recently, and it's uh, similar to Maggie in the sense that it also has a Kinect in her face, on his face. Has some speakers around her, uh, his head, and we communicate as well, like in Maggie, with an extended microphone. This is an overview of the system. 
in which we can see the ocular system, which is exactly the same, with some minor, minor modifications just to send some information to the interaction modules that we have built for this experiment, and for the also sending some output to the active learning module that we developed for this experiment as well. Here you have a, a white box uh, vision of the system, especially of the interaction system. We have an automatic speech, a speech recognition, which is, uh, is this time is not grammar based, it's an open text. And the main difference here is that the ocular, as I said, is sending the predictions to a fusion layer and sending these uh, predictions to the uh, active learning module. The active learning module, what does it do? Is I get the predictions of what the robot is seeing, and I analyze how certain on or how uncertain is the robot about these predictions. And it sends these predictions to the, this, sorry, this uncertainty to the fusion layer. The fusion layer, as we will see now, sends the information to, uh, aggregates the data from, from the sensor of the robot and from the other modules, aggregates this data and produces higher level information that goes to the brain of the system, which is the interaction manager or the multimodal dialogue manager. There is one aspect uh, that I consider interesting here in the fusion layer, which is uh, the NLP modules, the natural language processing modules that I built for this system. Mainly, as I said you, we are getting the, the user speech literally because it's an open text. So if I say hello to the robot, hello, I'm Victor, the fusion layer is getting hello, I'm Victor. No grammars, no semantics, no, nothing at all. So we need to post-process this information to get some higher level information that might be useful for the system. What we do? Well, we stem and lemmatize the, the words of the getting from the, from the, from the speech system. Lemmatizing means finding the root form of each word. Later on, what we do is we try to do a, pa a part, of, part of a speech tagging, which means uh, a syntactical analysis of the, of the speech. So we are looking for verbs, we are looking for nouns. And later on, we extract these nouns and these verbs and uh, uh, match them to certain commands, verbs, and to certain labels, or to labels, the nouns. Here you have a couple of examples. For instance, if I tell the robot, would you like to learn a new object? The first part is lemmatizing this. And would you like to, to learn a new object? They are all, all, these, all these words are already in the root form. So the lemmatizer will return the same. Well, next step is part of a speech tagging. So here we have a model, you have a pronoun, you have a verb here, which is learn. OK, and in the next part, I look for verbs. And one of the verbs, learn, is in the database of commands. So the user is trying to tell me if I want to learn something. The second example is, this is a ball. OK. We are in a part of the dialogue in which uh, the user is teaching me things. So I'm going to do the same. I lemmatize. And for instance, this is a ball. The lemmas are this be a ball. Is, the root form of is is be. And later on, I do a part of a speech tagging, which be is a verb. Ball is a noun. I'm looking for nouns. OK. The label that the user is giving to me is ball. And bear in mind that ball might be the first time that the robot has heard this word. But even though it will use it as a label of this new object. So what we are doing here is we are providing an almost infinite uh, way of getting, oh sorry, we are providing a way to the robot to get almost infinite number of labels. So this high level information is sent to the uh, interaction manager or the multimodal interaction manager, which is a production system. In the end, is a planner, a tree-based planner, which gets this higher level information, makes some decisions, and tells to the physical layer what to do. Tells the robot uh, to answer, tells the robot to, to finish the training, start the training, etc. The other module that we have built for this experiment is the active learning module, which, as I already told you, gets these predictions, analyzes the uncertainty of the robot of these predictions, and sends the uncertainties to the, to the fusion layer, which are fed to the, to the interaction manager, who will decide if uh, I need to ask or not. If I'm very uncertain, the dialogue manager will ask to the user. If I'm very confident, OK, I already know what the, the user is showing me. I'm not going to bother him. Okay. What kind of uncertainties uh, does the, uh, the system providing? Well, we are providing merging and Jensen Shannon divergence. The margin uh, what uh, provides is the most likely label, label 
of uh, data instance minus or compared to the second most lately label of this same data instance. And the Jensen Shannon divergence is a, is a query by committee heuristic where we have two committees, the RGB matcher from the RGB image uh, and the point cloud matcher from the point cloud. Both of them are providing some predictions. And what we are doing is we are comparing the predictions from one and the other. If both matchers disagree uh, or are in disagreement, that might be see that might indicate that the robot is uncertain of these predictions. So I'm gonna ask to the user, if both matchers agree in this committee, that means that the robot is uh, certain of what he's seeing, so let's not bother the user. We evaluated this in experiment uh, where we taught the robot for different objects. And here you have a video showing uh, the system working. You're going to see the first part, which is I'm training the system. Voy a enseñarte una cosa que quiero que aprendas. Se llama pelota. Vale, pelota. Ahora agarra el brazo para que lo pueda ver bien. Vale, ¿cuál lo veo? Y ahora voy a mostrarte un objeto nuevo. Ok, ¿cómo se llama este objeto? Pues es una taza. And now I'm going to show you how the robot behaves when it detects something uh, which is uncertain of. So the robot is going to ask me for the label of what I'm showing the robot. So those are the results of the system for 1, 10, and 20 different views for each object. And again, we've got the uh, worst performance in the point cloud compared to the RGB. But again, uh, mixing them or combining them, we got an aggregate uh, better F-score. For the uncertainty levels of the system, what we got is the Jensen-Shannon divergence, which is the, the heuristic that we use finally for, for asking to the user. Uh, we saw that 40% uh, of the times after training that the object was sh being shown to the robot, the robot would ask to the user. And this is because of the huge difference between the, the performance between the RGB matcher and the point cloud matcher. So we ended up with the robot with, in my opinion, was too verbose. It was asking too many questions. But this was good because we validated that the system, when it's uncertain, is asking to the user. But we have to fine tune uh, how much uh, queries does the, the robot to the user, asks the robot to the user. So that was for active learning of objects. Let's go for novelty detection. Our motivation here was what happens if you expose the robot to a new concept, something that he's, it's never seen before by the robot? We'll be able to detect that it's new. We'll be able to ask to the user, OK, I'm seeing something that I don't know what is it. Please tell me what are you doing. Or please tell me what do you have or what, what is your pose. And we apply it in the domain of post learning. 
And that's because we realized that in the pointing pos uh, poses, there was many, many people that uh, well, was hi high variance between the way of people tend to point. For instance, many people train the robot with, uh, they were right-handed people, so they train the robot with their right arm. But what happens uh, if some, uh, a left-handed person comes and tries to use the robot? Will the robot be able to, to detect that they are the same poses? Will the robot be able to ask the same questions? So that was our motivation. So what we wanted to do was enable the robot to learn from novel, from novel data. And for novelties, uh, we want to differentiate between noise and interesting things. We consider noise, for instance, uh, noise might come, for instance, from uh, something that the user has done by chance, or might come from a misreading of a sensor, of a misbehaving of a sensor. So we want to avoid asking to the user every single time I see something that is new. We want to, to be sure that it is really something new. And we, want, we wanted also to distinguish between what is known and what is strange to the model of the of the robot. So here uh, I'm going to explain you this concept in example. So imagine that we have a data set where the robot has learned uh, two different concepts that in the learning space in two dimensions are uh, depicting these two different clusters. And while the robot has been learning, it got also some noise in the form of outliers which have been discarded of the model. They are not part of the model. But while the robot is operating in the real world and it's getting more sensor data and it's getting more uh, situations, it's, it's receiving different outliers, perhaps different data that is uh, very, well uh, very uh, well predicted. But some of these outliers started to form a cluster here. So what's happening here? This is not noise anymore. This is an event that has happened several times. And because our assumption is that because it's already happened several times, it's likely that it's going to happen again. So what we want to do is we analyze with our model, with uh, our classifier that has learned these two clusters, how well I'm predicting this, this new event. And because it's a new event, we are assuming that the classifier will be very, very, very uncertain of this new cluster. Imagine that this new cluster might be a new pose that we are teaching to the robot. We are showing to the robot, sorry. So we, what we want, and the objective of this experiment was, we want to stop this considering as a cluster, an interesting thing, and we want to, to incorporate it to the system. So this cluster is something that is interesting because it is becoming a new cluster, a big cluster. And it was strange because it was not very well predicted by the model. So what we want to do is, it's something interesting and known. And we do that by asking to the user. For that, we are using techniques from the novelty detection field in machine learning, which in the end is uh, something that uh, try to address uh, the problem like that. So we have all the instances that we receive, and some of them are normal, so are, uh, are predicted by the model, and some of them are outliers. And what we want to do is detect what, when something stops become being an outlier, starts becoming cluster, we want to incorporate it to the model. Another idea is we want to control also, also what is normal and what is uh, a normal by the model. So to do, we control this area, which is uh, a standard deviation in this case. We control this by a parameter which uh, we call curiosity factor. And in the end, what we are controlling is the amount of sigmas in which we are considering things normal or non normal. The the flow diagram of the system is like that, like this one. We get new poses. We analyze whether it's interesting or not. So we analyze whether it's creating a cluster or not. And if it's not creating clusters, it means that it's noise. If it's creating clusters, we try to predict it with our model. If our model uh, does not consider this new cluster as strange, it means that it's already be well predicted by the model. If it's strange, it means that it's something that is interesting and it's not well predicted by the model. So we need to acquire this new knowledge. The experiment that in which we validated this was in the pointing uh, data set, but with the difference that we cropped the, the legs of the user just to simplify a bit the problem. 
Here you have an example of a, of a visual interface that we built. And here we have four different models we analyzed. Uh, Gaussian mixed models, SVM1 class, which is a version of the SVMs for novelty detection, LSA, which is a least square anomaly detection, and k means for anomaly de detection. So in this example, the, the model has been learned with the red poses, which is 12 users uh, teaching the row to the, the right pose. And every single new uh, pose is depicted in black. So the first time a new user, or perhaps the, the same user, uh, teaches the robot or shows the sorry not teaches shows the robot with a pointing left pose. The model is predicting predicting it as noise. Please uh, bear in mind the scale here because uh, because of this guy work uh, what is noise is is uh, changing the the scale. Okay, so the our filter or we build a threshold to detect novelties and non novelties in one. So as you will see, the the moment it passes uh, this threshold will be detected as as not novel and as not noise. So we show again a different pose, and because we are remembering what we have seen in the past, we are, uh, this noise score is being reduced at most to a half. So it is noise, but not so much noisy. And the third time you show the same pose, what is happening is, OK, you're showing me to me something that is happening again and again. Please, I'm going to, sorry, OK, it's not noise anymore, it's below one. And we analyze with my model. And because uh, my model is not predicting well, I'm asking to the user. Here you have the results and in of the system. And the behavior that we wanted to, to adopt in the system, turning this k parameter, this uh, curiosity factor, is the one that we have in the GMM and the k means. So we wanted that the first instance, the first time that you see a noise, uh, sorry, you see an instance, it's regarded as noise. The second time it's regarded as noise. The third time, OK, it may be not noise at all. So that was this kind of behavior. We weren't able turning this k parameter to to achieve the same uh, the same performance in the uh, neither in the one class SVM and the LSA. Regarding the strange, strangeness evaluation, what we did in this step was okay. I'm going to present to the system with things that are novel and things that are not novel, and we wanted you is to behave anything that is novel. You should tag it as novelty. And everything that is not noble, you should tag it as uh, something that is already known. And with that, we analyze the F score. And as you can see, the GMM and the one class SBM were the ones that performed better. So although this was a proof of concept that we built uh, to test if the road was uh, uh, able to detect novelties, uh, uh, we think that is a promising uh, area of research. We need some fine tuning of the K parameter. But I think it's possible to test this in a, in a real-time environment, and it's possible to test this in, a, in other environments. By the way, this uh, led us to two publications, one in a journal, and the other one was in a conference paper. So that was for novelty detection. Let's conclude this presentation. So the main objective that we have for this uh, thesis was to develop a system that enables a social robot to learn interactively and in a natural way. And I think that more or less we managed to, to, to build a system that behaves quite naturally, as you have seen in the videos. And we used two different approaches, as you have already seen, a grammar-based and a natural language processing uh, plus dialogue-based uh, approach. And both of them were quite uh, flexible and quite natural. Regarding the active learning aspects of our thesis, we studied how inaccurate answers from the users might affect the, 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 the learning of the robot. And we saw that they are really affecting, or they might really affect negatively this learning. So we came up with the extended filter, which kind of uh, mitigates uh, this problem in the area of, in the field of post detection. We believe that uh, this might be uh, worth studying in the future if it's, this applies to other areas. And also, uh, Another contribution of our thesis has been uh, enabling a robot to use active learning to keep learning after the training session has finished. And also to detect new th concepts that have never been seen before by the robot and try to acquire these new concepts. As a future work, regarding interaction, we want to study, or we focus in the robot aspects of how the robot learns, but now we want to focus how this robot learning is perceived by the humans. Regarding the active learning, what we want to do is apply this uh, 
uh, these ideas in a continuous learning s framework which, which we want to build. And of course, we want to apply this to other domains, like gesture recognition, activity recognition, etc. So this is the list of publications. Uh, during all these years, we published three, paper, th three journal papers and seven conferences. And we have ongoing two journal papers, one under review, the other one in preparation. And finally, all the code that I developed for this series is available on GitHub, so you can download it, you can test it, you can improve it if you want. Also, I encourage you if you want to improve it. And you have also the data set of the posts available on, on GitHub. So thank you very much for your time. That was all. Eh, muchas gracias. Eh, vamos a proceder al turno de preguntas. Eh, va a comenzar eh, el doctor Don Rodrigo Ventura de la Technical University de Lisboa. English not to embarrass myself because my okay. castellano is not uh, is not very good. So um, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Maria Malfaz and, and Miguel Salix for the invitation to be here. And so it's a pleasure to, to be here in the discussion of the Victor's thesis, which I uh, we have met some a couple of years ago um, on the Monarch project. Uh, I'd like to greet the members of the jury and uh, on behalf of the University of Lisbon uh, extend the, the greetings of the Hector to you. Uh, we have now, uh, we changed from uh, Technical University to now, to now to the University of Lisbon. And I'd like to greet the candidate and uh, the audience um, and wish the candidate the best, uh, um, best in this examination. So um, I will start by making a few comments on the, on the document and on the presentation. Then I will ask a few questions uh, to the candidate. So. Um, Concerning the document, I found, I found the document very well organized. Um, uh, I noticed that the, um, the strategy was to base the manuscript on papers, and so, um, which I think is, is a good approach. And uh, of course, there are some repetition across the, the chat yeah. because of that. But uh, um, it also, uh, I, I should praise the, the fact that there are three journal publications, one of them in first Pertil, and uh, I'm glad to know that you have two more, uh, one, in the uh, one in preparation and one submission, besides more seven conference uh, uh, publication, that is very good. Um, let, let me start by, I'd like to understand better, I mean, I didn't have the chance to, to check with the, the papers, but uh, what you have in your manuscript is it copy and paste from the paper, or how much have you changed the, the content? Well, uh, on the published papers I are the, the same version, correct, correcting some typos that we had, uh, okay. and nothing else. And the, the things that, uh, the other papers that we are on, on, on under review, uh, it's exactly the same, the same version. Okay. So you have a mapping between chapters and yeah. papers on yeah, time, yeah. okay. All right. Um, I uh, must say that I found a lack of uh, um, graf some graphical material, which I, I was glad to see here, some graphical material that is not on the, on, the, on the document. I'd like to see it more. And also algorithms. I mean, you have a uh, um, most textual description of what you are doing, but uh, uh, the lack of um, explicit algorithms in pseudo code uh, makes it harder to replicate the work in a yeah. different uh, uh, domain. So I, I like, I missed that a little bit to, to see how exactly did you implement that. And, uh, um, okay. Then you were focused in the beginning when you, when you state your goals on learning, on the problem of learning new concepts. But then in the context of this thesis, you are talking about uh, uh, supervised learning, I mean labeling, the problem of labeling yeah. uh, uh, data. And I'd like to, to know whether the candidate thinks that these concepts can be extended to learning in the more broader sense, uh, uh, like, I mean, we teach humans, not exactly this is a cup, but um, more complex scenarios, such as uh, uh, skills, learning skills. Do you want to comment a little bit on that? Well, this is one of the, the other domains that we want to test in the future. I think it's very interesting to, uh, as, as, you, as you can see, as, as we already said, is uh, we want to, to export this uh, concept learning to a utility of this concept. Why it's interesting to me knowing that uh, this is a cup, uh, perhaps I need to, to grab it and to pour uh, some, some water on it. And the main difference that, uh, that will up, um, between our work and the other work is uh, and, and, and the skill acquisition is that 
the approach is not uh, is not the same. It's, um, basically, in concept acquisition, you have supervised learning. In skill acquisition, many times you have uh, reinforcement learning, which are not quite the same. So mm -hmm. we have to study uh, which are the differences and which uh, are the ways to apply that. At this point, is is as I said, is one of the future works, and we have to analyze uh, how we can export these things. Perhaps uh, acquiring some knowledge about the uh, dynamical uh, acquiring of the of this knowledge, and the other way is. Uh, there is some active learning work in the literature where they are, for instance, the the, the robot asks future queries. In there is a, an example, for instance, from the I forgot the name. It's Georgia Tech uh, mm -hmm. people, from for instance, uh, uh, people from Andrea Thomas. Uh, they are doing skill acquisition, as you said, and they are the robot asks. Uh, it sees a demonstration from the user. So, for instance, uh, if I remember well, it was a plate-serving robot, uh, or cereal-serving robot, actually. So the robot was uh, taught the, the skill by just by moving the arm of the, of the robot. So the robot got all the information in sensory, not visual information, but uh, by, mm -hmm. the, by the proprioception of the, of the robot. And in the active learning part, okay, I see some demonstration of how the pouring is done. And in the active learning part, the robot tries to simulate this pouring of the cereals. And what the robot does is, I'm not certain if this is the correct trajectory, for instance, of this is the correct trajectory. So how, we, how much distance should be between the, the cereal can and the, and the ball? So one question that Robert might ask is, I'm not certain about the trajectory. So I'm going to ask to the trajectory. And it's a good thing, because many times in concept is hard to be explained by boys. But doing a demonstration is very, very easy. For instance, the robot should ask, I should do it like that? Or is it better if I do it like that? Okay. And the user will, will 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 respond. Okay, no, tons uh, not so um, uh, high. The emulation versus imitation yeah. issue when that appears when we talk about uh, uh, learning by demonstration. Okay, um, then um, you you acknowledge on the thesis that uh, your thesis is not much on in depth uh, uh, research on a, a single novel method, but you are integrating several methods together. Yeah. Uh, because you went to advance, I mean, to use these methods in novel ways, that uh, I found it uh, uh, a good approach for the problem that you, that uh, we have. But I mean, during uh, the reading the manuscript, now the for from your presentation, it became a little bit more clear. But it seems that uh, I mean, at first glance, it seems that you did several theses on once. <laughs> so you have I mean, each part is yeah. a different thesis. I mean, you started with interactive, and then you went to to active learning, yeah. and then uh, it seems that you are crossing uh, these methods with. Uh, uh, objects and poses. Okay, uh, can you? Why have you done that? I mean, instead of using one single problem and then compare it across of uh, those, why so many? Uh, why so many different uh, cross sections between uh, between these? Well, uh, mainly because th those were focused on papers, and we wanted to publish uh, different areas. And also, also the as as I was learning from active learning, I realized that, for instance. When I ask questions to the user, the user can be inaccurate. OK, I know that. Uh, once we realize that a way of overcome that, we wanted to start uh, doing uh, real active learning. So in the, in the object recognition experiment, we, we did uh, some, I'm uncertain, I'm asking you to you, I incorporate this to the system. But suddenly we realize that if I'm uncertain of already known objects, what happens if I have an unknown object? And that question was so itching to me that I wanted to to experiment in these areas. Well, that mm -hmm. I, uh, that is why I came with uh, with the pose uh, um, experiment mm -hmm. for for novelty detection, and because I was doing both things in parallel, and I wanted to explore this novelty detection area, and I already have the pose data set already available, and not the the object database uh, already. I use what data I, I already have. <laughs> That's the the main reason, mm -hmm. and because I. Uh, of, of these differences when we, you are cross-checking and, and we are uh, evaluating these, uh, or we wanted to evaluate these in, in different domains, mm -hmm. these ideas in, yes, in yes. different domains. So that's, that's the main reason, is just uh, doing yes. work in parallel and okay. one advances sometimes quicker than the other. Okay, I like more the, the, the answer on trying on different domains rather than uh, being able to publish yeah. many papers. And no, it's it not, no, it's you not are publishing you are many papers, but <laughs> it's just uh, the idea is uh, we have this question in mind and we wanted to to explore it and 
just that the, the both works were in, in parallel and one mm -hmm. of them advanced fairly quickly compared to the other. Especially because in the, in the second one, in the interaction one, uh, building interaction, uh, everything, every time that you put a human on the loop is very, very, very hard. It's very, very, very time consuming. Absolutely. So this work advanced fairly slower compared to the other work. So that's the main reason. But of course, we wanted to study, uh, and I was from the beginning, we wanted to study, or we have the feeling that testing this active learning approach in one single framework, for me, it's not enough. It's like, okay, you are focusing on single, but what happens if you go outside? So that's the, the idea. Okay. Uh, now, um, in the beginning of our presentation, you claim that the goal of active learning in this context is to um, improve speed, and performance in learning. Uh, but uh, did you measure these two things? Where they are, ma did you actually measure? And uh, did you found at the end data to support that in fact active learning when, with when compared with the passive learning did in fact improve speed and performance? Well, I, I didn't uh, formally because it's uh, all the literature agrees on that. For instance, uh, the second chapter in which I'm talking about uh, uh, active learning. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many examples in the book I'm, I'm, I'm citing the where uh, the, um, the li demonstrating these uh, these effects in many many data sets. Uh, active learner produces much better performance in terms of uh, learning speed, and sometimes okay. it's not so clear that uh, many times uh, produces this acceleration in sorry this uh, improvement in not only okay. the acceleration but also the improvement. So for us, it was already demonstrated in the literature. It was not a uh, uh, it was not our main objective. We, w we already believed that uh, what the literature said. And that's the reason why we found so surprising <coughs> that in the, in the POSIS data set, when we applied active learning to the filters, we got worse performance in, a, in, in passive mm -hmm. learner than in a, sorry, in active learners and in a passive mm -hmm. learner. So that's why at the beginning we thought, okay, no, we are not against the literature. The literature is telling us that okay. uh, active learners work better than, than passive learners. Okay, I'm not sure if I agree. I mean, you are presenting a thesis on interacting in active learning, and you are claiming that this is the, the good thing about active learning. And uh, um, I still miss that. Even if the literature says that, for your system, uh, I think that you should have uh, presented some uh, quantitative results on that. I mean, you present. Um, I looked for it explicitly and did not, and did not uh, find it. I think that uh, uh, you should have presented uh, any quantitative measurement of whether this happens. And uh, now that you mentioned the, the thing about the, the surprising the surprising fact, uh, you found surprising that uh, active learning does not improve performance. Um, I did not find that surprising, but maybe I got it wrong. So correct <laughs> me if I'm wrong, which is, so what you are doing with active learning here is that you are filtering uh, the, the data. Okay, so what you are doing is uh, getting from the interaction a data set for the machine learning approach, okay? Now with active learning, you get the same indication of relevance of features, okay? And w the result is you filter these features, and these features will not go to the machine learning. I mean, regarding of how well or how worse that is done, you will have less features to learn. Okay, yeah. and to me, it seems natural that uh, uh, the more features you have, the more performance you have in any situation. Even if you, I mean, if it is poor noise, that won't happen. But if there is the minimal correlation between these features that you filter out and uh, the classes, you will always improve. Uh, and of course you have also have the problem of overfitting the data. Yeah. Okay, so uh, did I get it wrong? I mean, no, maybe it's not here that collective learning is good, right? Uh, I didn't say it explicitly, but you're completely right. We are comparing, uh, we are not comparing, we are providing a data a feature selection. So the idea of feature selection is to accelerate learning, is uh, not the learning, but the, the fitting problem or the, or the fitting mm -hmm. of, the, of the algorithm. And also yes. reducing, as you say, the noisy data and uncorrelated data. And one of the things that we want to do in the future in, the, uh, in, the, in, this, uh, in this aspect is, okay, in post-learning, we know that uh, there is high correlation between the, uh, the body parts that are adjacent. For mm -hmm. instance, the elbow and the shoulder. If you move uh, an elbow, it's very likely that you are going to move the shoulder as well. So we want to study what happens if uh, there are some domains that this correlation is not so clear for the programmer, but might be clear for an algorithm that analyzes, for instance, the correlation between parameters in the learning space. So the idea is, 
or next idea that we want to study is how we do apply this in other domains. So we can uh, build a filter which is not hard-coded by adjacency, but just try to find from the data that you have the correlations between limbs. So in the end, uh, what we are doing is some future selection, automatic future selection, mm -hmm. and expanding a bit to what the user uh, has uh, told us, just but uh, finding some other correlations. If you tell me the head and the, and the neck, I'm going to find by myself the other correlated limbs that might be in interesting for me. So in the end, I'm getting the most useful data. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the end, the question arises is that, I mean, there are uh, methods for uh, uh, automatic feature selection. Uh, will they uh, outperform any manual feature selection method? So slash, do you think that still with automatic feature selection, there is value on having it actively learned from the user? Yeah, this is a great question. and. And it's very interesting because, uh, as I already told you, is, uh, this work is under review in a, in a journal publication. And we already received some feedback from the reviewers, and they asked the same question. They asked, OK, what will happen when you compare your baseline instead of a passive learner? Mm -hmm. What will happen if you compare to an to, um, automatic feature selection algorithm? Will it be the same? Uh, will it be better? Will it be worse? And I have an hypothesis right now. We, mm -hmm. uh, really, uh, we, want, we have to run the, all these tests. And my hypothesis is if you have lots of data, perhaps feature selection algorithms are good enough. But what happens if you are acquiring a new concept and you get very, very few data? Perhaps you don't have enough data to run a powerful, uh, or to get a very confidently the automatic feature selection problem. So why not to rely, when you have very few data, why not to rely on the user knowledge? And because the user might be inaccurate, okay, I'm mm -hmm. relying on you, but not so much. Okay. So yes. this is our, our next step. All right. I agree with that. And also, I wonder if uh, uh, what was on my mind was, you see, we are talking about having uh, too much little data for an automatic feature selection to be useful. And on the other side of the spectrum, where you have uh, so huge amount of features. I mean, imagine that you are capturing yeah. everything in an environment and there is no way that, I mean, becomes intractable to use automatic feature selection. So in that case, you need humans for that. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, okay, now on the, on the natural language processing approach that you use in the second part of the thesis, mm -hmm. I missed uh, details on how does it uh, really work. So you refer these uh, IWACI, uh, uh, production system to do the, the, the parsing. Uh, I'd like to know, I mean, I'd like to know to what extent you used previous work or you developed these production rules yourself? And if you did, why you don't mention that on the thesis? Uh, because uh, what we are doing is a third party uh, dialogue system, which is called Iwaki. Mm -hmm. And in this way, the, the work we are doing is not innovative. The innovation, I think, is to mix in this fusion layer before Iwaki. Okay. And we're providing some useful data for Iwaki. But Iwaki is a third party library that we are using, and it's, uh, it was built from a PhD thesis from. Okay. Uh, I don't remember the name. It's, uh, okay. it's a Russian name that is a very complicated. No I'm going to say it. What do they provide? What do you get at the output of, the, of this NLP system? Uh, the output is the verbs. And uh, just one thing the NLP system comes before the Iwaki. Mm -hmm. So I got the the raw text from the from the user, mm -hmm. and I parse as a, as I let me show you the example again. Oh, yeah, I think I've passed here. Yeah. So what I get here is I got the raw text of the user, and I use three steps. First, finding the root. Of these words, of, of these yeah. words, of uh, finding the syntactical analysis of this sentence, and when I got the names and I got the, the the verbs, I look for certain verbs which will be matched in a in a database. Again, mm -hmm. learning, stopping, uh, resuming, etc. That will be commands of the, the the user is telling to me, and the labels. And depending on the labels, um, that will mean that the object is uh, sorry the names that will mean that the user is telling me uh, an object label is it true that perhaps it would be very interesting to to draw a 
the tree of the interaction. As I say, the Iwaki provides plant trees. So perhaps uh, drawing a plant tree will be clear for you in which part I'm looking for verbs and in which part I'm looking for um, mm -hmm. for for names, object names. So more or less, this uh, plant tree is similar, not exactly, but similar to a state machine in the end. So what I'm doing is, depending on the interaction, the user is controlling the the uh, in which state of the state machine I am, or in which part of the plan I am. So depending on the plan in, in this Iwaki plan, uh, I will look for the verbs produced by the NLP, mm -hmm. and depending okay. of uh, in which part of the plan I am. If I'm just already start learning and I hear a name, I will use this name as a label of the data I'm seeing. Okay, but I mean, what you get out of the, the system is verbs, and then you have a, 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 a set of steps to translate it to to the to the decision making that we have implicitly yeah. over there. Is that it? Uh, I didn't quite catch your question. So what do you? What so you said you that the Iowaki provides you with the verbs and the names. No. No. Oh. Uh, Iwaki, Iwaki comes what here. What is it? What he enters in Iwaki? Yeah. Iwaki comes here. Okay. Here, here is Iwaki. In the core of this uh, multimodal dialogue manager is Iwaki. So what comes out from Iwaki are those uh, uh, three plans? Uh, those are three plans. Well, what comes out from, the, from, from that? And you process those three, is yeah. that it? These three plans are executed inside Iwaki. Mm -hmm. So it navigates during th the, the three plan. Okay. And, in, and in certain parts of the three plan uh, might be tell the user, okay, let's go to learn, because you have just asked me to, to learn. Okay, so, so those decisions are inside the tree? Yeah, are inside the tree. And you transverse that? Yeah. Okay, it would be nice to have that tech yeah, better yeah. explaining the thesis because yeah, I think you're right. it's a little bit cloudy. Okay, um, I don't know how much time do I have. Okay, okay. <laughs> I mean, I will continue <laughs> one more. I'll try to be brief. Um, Okay, so you refer to something that puzzled me a little bit is uh, you in the, um, from some point on, you start discussing a multimodal. Yeah. But uh, what is multimodal there? I mean, I, on, oh, oh, I only see a microphone over there. So where is the multimodality? Uh, in the poses of the user. For instance. But okay, but those poses go to the data set. Yeah. Right? So you are not, the multimodal dialogue manager does not receive input from the no. visual data. No. Okay, so why is it multimodal? From what you're questioning, what uh, I'm realizing is perhaps we we'll lock, uh, we'll lack in the description of this part uh, about how these plant trees go and, and everything. Because, for instance, in the in in this case, in this uh, in this case, I'm telling the robot I'm going to show you something, and the robot asks me, "Okay, show it to me so I can see it." And what I'm doing is I'm presenting the object to the robot. So at this point. I'm getting also also in the plan. I'm getting okay. I'm in this ah. part of the plan, and I'm waiting the user to show me this okay. object. And, and there the is moment a signal which is shown yeah. to me, and then you yeah. have a different decision. Okay. Yeah. So perhaps uh, right. perhaps we need to describe this better in the in 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 this part. Yeah. Okay. And have you thought about having other modalities other than those two? Have you thought about that? Does it make sense? For instance, uh, we didn't talk about, at, at this moment, we are okay. just uh, visual and auditive input, but okay. Okay. but uh, okay. not yet. I was wondering because something that interests me a lot is uh, the communication with robots going beyond verbal. I mean, can we communicate non-verbally with them? So that I was wondering mm -hmm. if in that direction. Now, uh, on the thesis um, in, in page 70, you have this, um, you have this W that two weights between two histograms, right? Sorry? So in page 70 of her thesis. I'm gonna grab, yeah. I can tell you. So it's a question 4.5. Yeah? 4.5. I don't not sure equation, if you showed it on this. 4.5? Yes. Page 7.0. So you are here, you are waiting basically two histograms, right? Yeah. Waiting between two histograms with this, uh, uh, with this W. And they have two questions. First is, um, the histograms are basically uh, uh, probability distribution estimation. Uh, and uh, couldn't you frame, I mean, and this weight, uh, 
weight the, from art understood the confidence that you have from on each one of these measurements could could you, uh, have you talked about having a, a bayesian approach to this instead of having this weight with this magical yeah. 0 0.6 yeah yeah it's that will be the next step you know. okay so Maybe. this was our first approach to this problem and we did the, the system uh, just empi okay. empirically we thought that that was enough for this uh, first pa first approach but in the end yeah these weights has to be in um, uh, delivered no uh, they these Better weights have to be decided uh, by some automatic algorithm that uh, yes. might be an okay. bias algorithm or y you only have consensus about this value of w of 0 0.6 sorry can you repeat you only have one sentence uh, just saying that you found empirically that the W of 0 0.6 produced mm. best results with uh, our data. And this is not really, it's not very clear. I mean, I was um, wondering whether it makes any sense to, to study the, the influence of this W on the, and then you could show, do you see in this plot, this is the best. Yeah, yeah. That could be. Mm. I agree with you. Uh, I completely agree with you. But for us, uh, there is a previous step, which will be, make this matcher uh, work better right now Sorry, this matcher, the 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 point cloud matcher uh, didn't work as well ah, as okay. we thought so, okay, so next work to improve yeah, the, the first first have some matchers that work similarly well and later on try to to find in which moment perhaps in some situations it might be uh, more interesting to to rely on one matcher and mm -hmm. other situations uh, might be interesting in the other and one of the things I thought about that is uh, why not using as, as well active learning uh, or this automatic mm -hmm. approach of uh, asking the user in, in several times for instance in, in, in different situations one of the th questions that or one of the things that we have been thinking of it's why happened if suddenly you have very low uh, certainty in the in one of the matchers. Perhaps imagine that you turn off the That's lights, right. but your depth data from the Kinect is you are receiving depth data because you have the point cloud which is infrared red light. So perhaps you switch off uh, this uh, waiting uh, the prefix waiting uh, part, and I just rely on the yeah. on the on the other one. Making, making it yeah. more dynamic. I mean, since we have this range, we could just you could simply have some measure on the on the dispersion and then maybe use yeah. that. Okay, I will just finish with the um, one question now. Since the, your thesis covers so much work, mm -hmm. and I have to praise that, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing what you have presented us. Thank you. Uh, could you um, synthesize in one sentence what is your main contribution, the one that you are more proud, if you want to say that? What is your main contribution well, here? Uh, more novel that you would like to um, yeah. highlight? Well, perhaps the one I'm most proud of it, uh, there is not one single contribution because I, I'm very proud of the- You have to choose one now. Yeah, Sorry. I have to choose one <laughs> now. Okay, I'm gonna choose one. It's perhaps the, uh, these novelty ideas, okay. uh, uh, these ideas of novelty detection to a robot. I was uh, astonished to see that nobody uh, thought of so profoundly you know, about uh, enabling a robot to detect its own gaps in the knowledge and asking to the user and using the interaction. I, I have the user. Mm -hmm. The user can help me to, to, to acquire more knowledge and, and do it in real time. And, sure. and I think this is perhaps the contribution which I'm most proud of. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Gracias. Thank Muchas you. gracias. Thank you. 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 Grateful to be here today, sharing this uh, special moment with you. Uh, I know you have worked uh, very hard on your thesis, and, and um, I not only know it uh, because uh, I know you, I know how you are, and how you professional uh, professionally work, but also because of the document and your um, main contribution that, that I think it's not only special, but also very well documented in the uh, book you have presented, uh, which is uh, nowadays uh, something difficult to find, I must say. <laughs> I, I have a, I would say, wide experience in reading documents and it's not that easy to uh, structure the contents, to highlight the main uh, highlights yeah. and to share it uh, with the audience, which is not usually uh, as, uh, let's say, expert as expected because we are coming from different fields and it's not 
easy to you know concentrate the, the, the focus on a specific topic. So um, for me, the documents uh, the document has been very very well organized and written, and I think it's a good contribution uh, that you have a structured uh, as chapter or um, as a paper, yeah. uh, which is. A, it's now nowadays it is like a trend and uh, uh, mm, even even uh, the, 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 the trend is more than you you yes the um, present the series of papers and that's it with no yeah. integration between them so um, I know it is an effort that you have integrated uh, uh, the the documents or the papers into one single document and maybe it is because sometimes Okay, there are mm, <laughs> interconnections between parts, but it's also th that redundancy is also important, as it is in learning, as we yeah. will discuss in a, in a minute. So, um, I think uh, in general the document is very, very, very good, apart from some typos and, and no current, current <laughs> and normal things. Okay, so um, I think that your your thesis is very complex in the sense that uh, we are trying to. I mean, learning is very complex. And for yes. sure, you cannot um, mm, implement in a robot all the um, decisional uh, algorithms to, to learn as we do as humans. Mm -hmm. So it is very difficult first to, to know what the main fe features in learning are so that you really somehow erase or eliminate the rest and keep the main ones so yeah. that you guarantee that with that reduction, which is very heavy somehow, mm -hmm you can implement them in the robot and you can guarantee the learning. Yeah. So this is very, very, very important. And, and, and sometimes uh, maybe we, we can, it's also my opinion, maybe we can think it's very restrictive, restrictive to your application and to a social robot, as you very well said in your, in your title, <laughs> okay? Yeah. Uh, because I'm coming from more from the human robotics and, and it's different or, or manipulation and it's totally different. But I think it is, it is very important that you, for sure, apply your uh, solutions to your specific cases. I, I mean, to find out a solution which is uh, very general and very applicable, it's not possible. Okay, yeah, so so, so yeah. it is good that you had uh, the um, the I mean the, the the time to really discuss on the main things and and regarding learning. And in this case, you, okay, you you decided about poses and objects, and uh, it's a good thing. A good starting point for for the robot to interact with you to learn and to somehow um, be like your partner in the main mm, simple uh, um, activities in the yeah. day life. Uh, so it, I think it's uh, good. I agree with these two um, tasks, let's say, or mm -hmm. rec the recognition. Maybe some others could have been discussed. Uh, maybe this is something I miss a little bit. Why poses and objects recognition and no other type of interaction? Mm, yeah. Because the field is very open, as you may think. So maybe in this part, I would agree uh, in, in including um, just a justification yeah. of why these two, okay? And um, the, the, the only thing I'm missing a little bit is, I agree with Professor Rod Rodrigo when he says that uh, um, I, I, um, the algorithm discuss discussion is important. Yeah. Because uh, in here, and this is something very valuable in your, in your thesis, you have implemented, you have, pro you have programmed, you have yeah. implemented the code, you have, uh, you have been fighting with the, yeah. uh, the, the software, with the hardware, and it is very, there are other theses which are, which are not dealing with, that, with these aspects, and uh, this is something very valuable, because implementation mm, somehow affects totally the results, and we will discuss it a little bit later. So maybe I miss an implementation chapter, because uh, mm, you, you, you state or you claim that the, it's used in real-time applications. Yeah. So then, then the, the algorithms are very important in that, yeah. in that, in that part. So an, an another thing I miss is that, um, I, and I would like you to give me, this is my first question. Since you say it is for um, useful, let's say, for real-time applications, I would like to know what's the, the, the time it requires uh, for the user and the robot to learn and to finish the learning process because uh, um, I would like to know exactly more quantitative data as Rodrigo, Rodrigo said uh, and uh, it would be great if you could at least tell me some quantitative uh, parameters about the learning more than the fact of uh, um, 
for, for sure, considering that you can uh, be uh, very successful in the interaction or very unsuccessful in the interaction. So as, a, as an average, which is the, the, the time required for the learning in whatever pose an, or an object recognition. Okay, but when, when you're asking for the time, what are you asking me exactly? Uh, is the, yeah. the, the fitting time of the algorithm or the whole session or the whole training session the, that you need? The whole session and how the, impl the algorithm you're using affects that. Okay. The time required for the algorithm to execute all the mm, parameters perceived by the sensorial sy yeah. system, but, but also, and very importantly, how the user uh, affects yeah. that, because uh, this is something I'll, I'm going also to ask you about. Okay, so you already seen in the videos uh, some qualitative data of how long a training session is. I've taught the robot three poses on the video, on this part of the video was uh, like one minute, mm -hmm. because the, the limiting factor here is not the learning algorithm. The learning algorithm we can, we can consider it almost instantly. Uh, the, the limiting time is, uh, is the interaction between the user of the robot, because Imagine that uh, in, a, in a regular machine learning uh, uh, data set, you can have the, your data set, you point and click the, the labels of the instances that you are seeing. But here, the interaction is verbal. And not in human robot interaction, but in human computer interaction, it, it is well known that uh, verbal interfaces are very slow compared to the point and click, for instance. So this is a limiting time. I, I didn't uh, calculate it, as you, as you said, but uh, it's usually about one training session of three poses, maybe one minute, two minutes, depending on okay. how well the robot is understanding the user, because you have also the also the, the ASR, and the ASR sometimes fail, and the user doesn't pronounce quite well, so the robot will ask again, please, can you repeat again? So mm -hmm. this um, um, enlarges a bit the, the, the time required for this process. And this is one of the main reasons. This limiting fact time factor of the, of the interaction, this is one of the main reasons to me to use active learning because the idea of active learning is I'm just asking for the most interesting questions so that means that I'm not going to need as many questions as a passive learner sorry I'm not going to need as many training examples as a as a um, passive learner mm -hmm. so that means that if I need one minute per three instances for instance uh, and I need 100 instances I'm imagining, uh, I'm just guessing numbers. But if I need to learn some certain problems, 100 instances, and I need to do it verbally, that will be a very, very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And if I have an active learner that learns fairly quicker than, or fairly faster than, than the passive learner, perhaps I can reduce, I don't know, by half? So you are reducing a lot of the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. But is, is it yeah. true that uh, we didn't uh, measure this time? Uh, at this point, we didn't uh, focus on this. There are some work uh, that uh, analyzes the human part of view, uh, the human point of view of this robot learning, mainly by Rosenthal and and, and Kakmak, uh, especially Kakmak in the in the Georgia Tech uh, did some studies about uh, which kind of questions are better perceived by the humans, uh, which kind of questions are or how the robot verbosity affects to the human impression of the robot, mm -hmm. and this is one of the things that we want also to study to, to study here and, and to apply this. Okay and. This is, well, for sure, the user, and it leads me to the following question. The user is very important in the interaction. Is the one leading to a successful experience or not? Yeah. And together with the dialogue system, I would say, more than vision, because in here, okay, you use vision, yes, the, but in a, in a second play, yeah. pl place, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Uh, but by the way, did you did you thought about uh, think about any other type of technology when approaching your your solution? Why Kinect or no other? Maybe it is something you know, I know Maggie has already. Yeah. So, but uh, well, later we will discuss about it. But uh, uh, in in that case, Kinect is good enough for your approach, or have you considered to change the technological solution of your approach? Well. Uh, Yes, because uh, Kinect, uh, when when Kinect came out, it was a revolution in robotics. Hmm. That was uh, the the things that Kinect is providing uh, to roboticists is are amazing. We have a very low cost sensor that provides reasonably good data. It is not perfect. Perhaps we can have much more precision with a with a laser range finder, mm -hmm. but the Kinect provides somehow. Uh, um, 
a compromise between uh, between quali quality of the data and and cost yeah. and also for instance uh, with the la laser image finder you need to scan uh, uh, the scanning process is is is, uh, is longer than with a kinect. With a kinect, you get a wall snapshot of the of an area of about uh, 60 de 60 degrees. So, in this case, it's well enough. We get the positions of the user with uh, th sorry the the position orientation of the user joins with fairly reason reasonable uh, precision. But at some cases, uh, we might need a solution. Perhaps one of the things that we are thinking of uh, is using the kinect too. Again, is a is an iteration of the Kinect, which uh, is uh, at almost at the same almost at the same cost, mm -hmm. but uh, with uh, much greater precision. So this might be one 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 different approach. Other uh, there are other sensors that we might use, like stereo cameras. But the stereo cameras need some uh, they have some processing, and it's a bit harder to set up. Not the research part, but the engineering process is is harder than with the Kinect. With the Kinect is uh, almost plug and play, mm -hmm. you know. It's yeah, uh, yeah. it's fairly easily. It's not plug and play, but the engineering process that you require for for using the Kinect is much shorter than with other sensors that we know, or at least we yeah. consider in our research group. I agree that you have to simplify the technology, but somehow uh, the complete set uh, of technologies you use affects uh, the robustness of yeah. your approach, and that's my catching yeah. up on my previous question. Yeah. Um, how robot is it is, for instance, when you have obstacles uh, uh, around the, the user or when the user is moving very fast or is not placed exactly in a position. I mean, th that yeah. type of uh, measurements are important in, in the yeah. um, uh, measuring, measuring the successfulness of the... Yeah. And uh, another thing is the, the dialogue system because um, oh yeah. I have one question. Um, to what extent your approach uh, fits the dialogue system as it is right now? Or have you been able to modify your dialogue system so that it really supports your, your approach? Uh, you know what I mean? I, I think Maybe, so. I mean, yeah, me because uh, you have a, a specific technology and you yeah. have to deal with it. Yeah. And it's going to somehow affect your final approach yeah. your final solution yeah. so um, when dealing with the dialogue system you have used it and it has many limitations okay yeah. so yes. you you have to adapt to that so that you can use it and demonstrate through ex experiments that you're mm, you are achieving your your uh, results okay so to what extent the type of dialogue system you're using is affecting the decisions on uh, on a previous uh, stage about how to mm -hmm. classify the information, ask the, the robot, process the results, and so and so on. Well, uh, the dialogue system that we are using, Iwaki, I think it's a state of the art right now. It's the the best that we have, and it has some problems and it has some limitations. But uh, some of these are engineering related. So about how this implementation, as you said, in implementation is is paramount. Uh, it's really important, but. When we looked to the state of the art of dialogue management systems, what we found is we don't have the dialogue systems that we want in robotics. There, there, there is no such point. solution. Right now, That's many of the dialogue question. systems that we have, um, the state of the art of dialogue systems for, in general, not for robotics, because robotics is a special case, mm. they are thought uh, with one scenario in mind, and this scenario is uh, phone calling attention. So when you call uh, your phone company and they uh, put an automatic oh, yeah, uh, yeah. speech system, what you are having in the, in the back end, you have a dialogue system, which is a very simple dialogue system, but uh, with some rules which uh, is uh, conducting you through a plant tree which, uh, or with a certain um, uh, state in which try to find to to find out which is your problem and how to solve it. And as you might already found out, if you are uh, sometime have you called your phone company, many of the times you have to wait until an operator is available to talk with them. Because covering all the possibilities that you might find in a phone call is very, very complex. So imagine this complexity in a human-robot interaction. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, this problem is not yet solved. And and we need uh, much work in dialogue systems, in developing uh, dialogue systems that are not thought of um, for phone call uh, attention, but for human-robot interaction, with all the nuances and all the particularities that we have in human-robot interaction, which 
are <coughs> real com really complex. They are really, really complex. And mm, mm -hmm. uh, by the way, I remember just the name of that, uh, the guy that developed Iwaki is Maxim Makachev. He's a, he's a, um, a person who, was, uh, de who developed uh, Iwaki in the CMU for when, when he was doing his, his PhD in robotics. So this, uh, this dialogue system was uh, developed for adapting uh, dialogue systems from phone call uh, companies uh, and trying to adapt to, um, to a robotic uh, attendant in hotels mm -hmm. uh, who was uh, in the reception of the hotels, try to, uh, to, to provide some help to, to people coming to this hotel. Mm -hmm. And as I say, absolutely, this is a very, very limiting factor. And we have some limitations. The, f the first limitation I, I feel I have is from the engineering point of view. If we want to cover uh, many situations, right now in dialogue manage management systems, you have to pre-code, you have a plan, which is each plan can cover, depending on your skills as an engineer, it can cover a wide range of, uh, of situations, but in the end, you need to pre-code everything yeah. or many different situations. And if you as a programmer don't think of kind of situation, kind of a problem, the dialogue will uh, misbehave or won't be able to behave as expected. So my idea or my opinion here, and this is my own opinion, is that at some point we need some learning as well to construct these plans and to construct That's this. And, but this is right now a very long-term uh, objective that yeah, uh, we totally have as a robotics community. Yeah, I totally agree. So, but but it, in the end, you would say that your technology has supported your previous ideas and you didn't have to change them much in order to adapt to your system, which is, this is just to validate how, how good or how, yeah, how good Maggie it yeah. is uh, as a software and hardware system to this kind, for this kind of uh, yeah. um, dissertations. So, yeah. so it's, it is good. I mean, yeah. I, I guess you have to, to deal with some problems, but finally, if it is quite flexible and quite open, it is good, yeah. as I guess it is. Yeah. Okay, um, regarding the user, uh, I have a question. Did you, did you tell them when you did the tests, did you tell them how to interact with the, with the robot a priori? Or... Um, can you, how successful the results would be if you don't tell the, user the users how to operate, how to deal with them, and let them to tell freedom to interact, ask the question, for sure, uh, being a Maggie, the one leading the conversation, but, uh, you know, total freedom for them to decide uh, how to speak to the system, which terms to use, and without thinking about labels, bec labels because you are the one who, who know that, and for sure in the lab condition, yeah. the results can be very, very good. But uh, I'm very interested in that interaction, how limited it was when you did the tests and the previous knowledge of the user. Yeah, so this is a great question because it's, uh, I believe what you are asking is what's the state of the art of human growth interaction? Yep. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> this is your question, <laughs> basically. That's it, yeah. Uh, well, we have human growth interaction in labs, mm. which I believe at least ourselves, we are m more or less managing uh, to, to, to provide some situation. There is a huge effort in engineering effort. It's a huge engineering effort because of this uh, limitation of the dialogue systems. So we need to provide a very simple in human robot interaction. There is many hours of work behind that robot. And this is very costly for us because we are a research lab. No, we are not a company that is yeah. producing a, a robot and open this robot into the wild. So what will happen is that I don't know yet. <laughs> uh, we want to explore these things. Uh, for instance, we are in a project, in the Project Monarch, and one of the things that we want to do is uh, put this robot on the into the open, uh, into an hospital scenario, and this robot should be moving around the, the hospital and interacting with people. But the thing that we are realizing in this, uh, in this project is, okay, we are putting a robot outside the lab uh, scenario and this is really hard this is really really hard because the amount of situations that can occur yeah. uh, in a very simple scenario for instance we have one scenario which is the road patrolling uh, through the hospital corridors and the amount of situations that the road might encounter just by patrolling around there are uh, for the engineering point of view almost unmanageable so mm -hmm. you have to be uh, uh, Aware, we be conscious, consci conscientious about uh, 
many, 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 many situations that every time uh, that we go there, go to the hospital, and we see the, the robot interacting or moving around, and we learn a lot. Be that means that if we are learning every time that we go, that means that we need a lot of work to do. And there is one thing that is good for us, that uh, the, the project is uh, tailored for children, and children has uh, children have very high expectations of, from robotics, but also very good expectations. So they are expecting uh, many, many things that uh, we can we can play with them, in the sense that uh, perhaps if the robot is misbehaving, like uh, perhaps if the robot is lost, perhaps the children won't perceive that, or perhaps they will be likely to help the robot. So mm -hmm. we can try to force the situations, like uh, in like uh, we can hide these limitations of the human robot interaction just to appear that the robot is playing it or with them or mm -hmm. just asking for help and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we can do if, uh, if we put a robot in the open field might be use the robot just to provide you help. So for instance, every single user interface, whether it is so good that you don't need an explanation to use it or you need some help from the system itself. So in many phone applications, for instance, the first time you open this application, you have a tutorial of this application. If yeah. you click here, you, it happens that. If you click to, if you swipe, or you, so in robotics we need to do the same. So yeah. we need a tutorial mode. If we put a robot into the wild, we need a tutorial mode of the robot, perhaps playing with the children, perhaps playing with the, with the users that are coming to the, to the lab. But we have to tell somehow how to, how to interact with the robot. Yeah, for sure. Well, there is a long, uh, yeah, uh, f <laughs> you know, uh, trip <laughs> to to reach that position. Okay, yes. D regarding the object's uh, recognition, when you um, present the object to the robot, uh, the hand is in there. Your your fingers are in the scene somehow. Yeah, well, and um, I mean, but for sure you don't use. I mean, we are speaking about a very serious topic here, yeah. which is object recognition. It's uh, in your thesis. You, I mean, you for sure it works to a certain extent, which is good. But I mean, it is very ver a very deep uh, discussion uh, on that. But um, my question is, uh, for sure, I guess you didn't use a, a model for the hands or. No. And did you analyze how um, how important it is, uh, which, for instance, which hand you use for grasping the ball or grasping the objects or, I mean, the occlusions and all these kind of things? I mean, um, could you somehow uh, give, a, uh, give us a quantitative uh, measure of how successful the system it is, even when you're using the hand and for sure, thanks or because of the use of the hand, you can also be uh, being uh, capturing a totally different shape. Yeah. So how to identify that it's part of the hand and it's part of the object? I mean, it is quite difficult. Yeah. So and very depend de um, determining the, the final uh, solution or uh, yeah. So yeah. could you discuss a little bit about it? Yeah. Uh, what we did is try to, to approach to this problem uh, by Introducing a model of the hand, but this was too complex. It was in an, uh, an it's an unsolved problem right now. Uh, how to make a model of the hand to to make uh, object recognition? So what we do is like present the object, trying to occlude the minimum as possible to the object. That's it. If mm -hmm. I do like like that, the yeah. robot will have lots of problems. But I found uh, and I was worried about that. But um, I attended to the Humanoid Conference uh, last year here in Madrid. Mm -hmm. To a, to a workshop in, in active learning. And there was a, um, a, a postdoc uh, who was uh, presenting at this uh, conference. And I was, he told me one thing that uh, I liked a lot because he was doing some uh, active learner uh, for the, uh, um, recognizing objects just by how these objects sounded. And uh, like it was like doing things with different objects, the different sound will, will uh, uh, Everything different objects produce different kind of sounds, so the object, uh, the, the robot was self-exploring how the the different sounds. After that, he came to pick the weight of the object, so he was using the proper yeah. the proper perception. And what he was doing at at the moment of this workshop was, okay, we have sound, we have proper perception. Let's introduce vision. And the moment he introduced vision, he thought the same as I. We need a model of the hand. 
okay? Doing a model of the hand is fairly complex. Let's remove the hand. And when it removed the hand and compared the results uh, between using the hand and not using the same hand of the, of the robot, uh, when the robot was using the hand, uh, it got better performance than when the, the hand was uh, manually removed from the data set. So we are not sure uh, if introducing the hand, perhaps the way you grasp an object, it's also defining some particularities of this object. How big is it? Uh, how uh, pickable is uh, in So perhaps using, introducing these features might help to the robot to learn as well. So when I saw that, okay, I'm a bit relieved now. <laughs> perhaps the hand is not so big problem right now. Perhaps in the future we need uh, Okay, to, to this is very interesting. I, I think it, it has been, it would have been very, very nice if you have it, uh, had introduced that uh, yeah. discussion on, on the chapter. Yeah. That's why, because mm, it's just to somehow to range the expec e expectation of the yeah. reader, okay? Yeah. So, uh, but it's nice. And uh, well, I don't want to be very insistent uh, on that, but uh, let's just uh, ask you s just one more question. You, you, you th said that um, the curiosity parameter, let's say, uh, could be applied to other type of uh, applications. But uh, could you be more specific? Yeah. Not the curiosity, but the novelty detection system. Novelty, want that's to, it. Want that's to it. To yeah. yeah. Hmm. Which, as for instance, which type of applications? Because uh, th there is a sentence in, in your yeah. slide saying that. But uh, for instance, so the next, uh, the next uh, domain that we where we want to test it is in object recognition. What happens if I'm showing a, uh, okay. a mug of coffee, and someday I show you a glass, or uh -huh. a glass? shouldn't be transparent because you won't see the grass, but uh, if you introduce another object. So I think that it's, it is possible to apply this in very easily. So take it with a pinch of salt, please. But it's possible to adapt fairly quickly from, from post uh, recognition to object recognition. And this is uh, one of the things that I want to test okay. in different domains. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice. Just to finish, because I forgot something, in the video in which you are presenting the objects to the robot, um, you do it twice. With, if, I, if I'm not wrong, you present the objects, for instance, the cap, or, and there is another moment in which you present the cap in more more hidden way, and then the robot asks, asks again to... Can you show it to me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. And in, in this second uh, round, let's say, um, once the robot is able to perceive it correctly, uh, she asks you, what's the name of that? Uh, yeah. But uh, why don't you use uh, the previous knowledge about that? Because if, if she decided uh, she has recognized the, 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 the object correctly, then why to ask if she previously learned that, you know? I don't know if I am wrong, uh, probably. <laughs> I, I mean, in the video in which you're presenting, yeah. um, Maybe it's for a new object, okay? But mm -hmm. I'm not sure. But in the, I thought it was a second round, in which okay, this is uh, this is the the cap, okay? Yeah. And then she learned learned, learned about it, yeah. and then in a in a following I iteration, you yeah. uh, show the same object, yeah. but uh, with uh, some yeah. hidden parts, so okay. she can't recognize that, and she asks to move it in different views, yeah. and, and th then she says, okay, I got it. Then what's the name of that object? No. Is it like this, or if it no. was previously learned, she totally recognizes and tell you, okay, no, this is the, yeah. the cap. Okay, no. Or Here not. what I'm doing is I'm forcing the, the robot to ask you for, for this it. object. Uh -huh. I'm forcing it yeah. just to show you how the process of, lay of a new object uh, is, uh, is done. So the idea is uh, this is an object which I'm presenting to the robot. The uncertainty levels are very low artificially, uh -huh. and the robot asks for, for, for an instance, a data instance of this, of this new object. A data instance means what the robot is seeing plus the label. Yeah. Perhaps the label, or perhaps you can enrich the interaction. Oh, at cab. Okay, I, r I remember that sometime I, I saw a cab. Uh, well, yeah, how silly I am. So things like that. But this is a problem of interaction. What I'm doing is uh, okay. just please show me that, that object because I'm not sure which object is it. Perhaps I could say, it, for instance, if I, uh, if I analyze, one of the things that we can do as well is I'm getting the predictions, uh, and I'm getting the uncertainty of these predictions. So, because we are using margin, for instance, if we have a very short margin between a cap and a ball, you can say, I'm not sure if it's a cap or it's a ball. Can you tell me? So, I'm, I can use active learning to ask questions in, in this way as well, but this is just for interaction sake, you know? Okay. 
Okay, but in any case, if, if she recognizes the object previously learned, she would tell you. It can tell you. Yeah. Okay. It's not built in the system right now, but you okay, you that's my question. Yeah, yeah. It's not just okay in yeah. the system right now. Okay, yeah. that's all. Thank, thanks a lot, and thanks uh, also to your uh, advisors. Thanks very much for this invitation. I really enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you. Eh, bueno, primero voy a pedir, pedir perdón porque voy a realizar las preguntas en castellano, perdón, okay. sobre todo para nuestro invitado. Eh, bueno, lo primero, felicitarle por el trabajo realizado, eh, me parece un trabajo muy completo, eh, muy interesante, eh, con muchas aplicaciones. También quisiera felicitar a los directores, eh, hacer extensiva la felicitación. Tenía eh, varias eh, preguntas. Eh, son preguntas bastante puntuales. ¿eh? Eh, por ejemplo, en, en el capítulo 3, cuando se realiza el aprendizaje de posiciones, eh, no me queda del todo claro si re, eh, realmente el aprendizaje es eh, estático o dinámico. Digamos que si el robot va a realizar el aprendizaje cuando ya está eh, la mano extendida eh, o si realmente emplea todo el movimiento de la, de la posición de la mano, que de alguna forma podría ser incluso como más más natural cuando, por ejemplo, una persona intenta interactuar con un robot, incluso pues, bueno, encadenando distintos gestos eh, seguidos hacia un lado o hacia otro, ¿es sí. estático o es dinámico? Eh, eh, si quiere, con, eh, conteste en inglés por deferencia con... Vale. So, yes, uh, that was one of the first thing, things that we realized at the beginning. So if the user, well, by definition, a pose is a static... Uh, snapshot of a, of a user. So at the beginning, what we realized is, okay, let's, learn, uh, let's teach the robot with some poses. And you are constantly uh, recording. And what we got is, I'm doing a pose. I do the next uh, pose where we put the, the difference between one and the other. So if we get all the different, uh, all the movement of the, of the poses. When it stops being a uh, pointing right and starts becoming a pointing front pose. So that was a... Uh, not clear for us, and it was a situation in which uh, we wanted to avoid this uh, discrepancy uh, between where one pose and, um, begins and, and ends, and we wanted to uh, simplify the problem. So what we did is we are uh, analyzing the speed of the user, the speed of each, every single joint of the user. So what we do is we wait the user to stay still, and when we were sure with a short window uh, that the user is completely still, is when we grab a snapshot of this pose. Eh, bueno, eh, eh, también eh, se habla siempre de la cámara RGB y tampoco tengo claro del todo si realmente está utilizando algo de información de color o simplemente, por ejemplo, para el cálculo de, la, de las características ORB, ORB, que es la que me parece sí. que utiliza, eh, emplea siempre y llanamente imágenes en niveles de gris y si mm, se emplea en imagen en color... Eh, bueno, eh, sería más adecuado ir a un espacio RGB o tal vez a un espacio H HSI, LV, LAB, LAB, que fuera de alguna forma como más eh, robusto ante cambios de iluminación, eh, brillos, mm, situaciones sí. que, que se pueden producir. Pues sinceramente, eh, sorry, es, <risa> honestly, eh, right now is RGB, raw RGB. We got some results from that which uh, we were happy enough, but uh, We bear in mind that uh, we w wanted to avoid uh, taking too much time in the computer vision process. So what we build is a, is a, um, a system that works enough. Mm -hmm. And because the big problem of the detection was on the point cloud matcher instead of the RGB matcher, we didn't pay much effort on the RGB matcher. That was working well enough for us. But you're right, uh, choosing a different color space, or for instance, you can, uh, I told you that I have a, um, a committee of two members, one for RGB, my uh, feature the detection, another one for the, um, for the point cloud. Why not, for instance, I, I'm just thinking of uh, right now, is why not using a third matcher in another color space, or a fourth matcher in an even other another color space that will might be uh, uh, an interesting approach as well mm -hmm. just to analyze uh, in real time which matchers providing better uh, better eh, en el capítulo en el capítulo 4 se habla de tracking pero realmente tampoco se realiza tracking más o menos 
Yes and no. Yes and no. Mm. We are doing tracking of the hand just to crop the object around the hand. But once you are uh, uh, cropping the hand, you are not uh, looking for an object. You are assuming that you already have an object in this hand. Mm. Mm. Eh, eh, se han realizado eh, pruebas con, se, eh, con seis objetos en, pri uh -huh. en principio. Ahí. Eh, luego incluso en el capítulo 6 se cambian a cuatro objetos. No tengo claro por qué se cambian de objetos. No, eso no. Y, y también eh, no sé hasta qué punto los resultados se podrían extrapolar si se empleasen más objetos. No sé, por no. ejemplo, eh, bueno, que a lo mejor es. Eh, yo me acuerdo hace tiempo haber eh, usado la base de datos esta coil de que tiene 100 objetos con. Parece que son. No sé si son con 24 vistas eh, de cada uno de los 100 objetos un poco para realizar temas un poco de, de reconocimiento, ¿no? Uh -huh. ¿Se podría, ¿Los resultados serían extrapolables con una base de datos de esas dimensiones o cómo lo ve? I don't think so because uh, I don't know this data set, but uh, it's, it's a data set uh, with handheld objects as well. <laughs> bueno, no, eh, lo que me refiero es que solamente usáis seis, seis objetos ah, okay, okay. para, digamos, para, yeah. eh, digamos, o sea, para, para realizar el reconocimiento, ¿no? O sea yeah. que eh, por ejemplo, ¿no? O sea, que a lo mejor, pues, ¿cómo se comportaría las tasas de éxito si, por ejemplo, hubiera 20, 30, 50 yeah. o 100 objetos que podrían ser eh, unas situaciones... Evidentemente, me imagino que las tasas de éxito irían cayendo, ¿no? Mm -hmm. Pero no creo que fueran subiendo. Pero vamos, eh, ¿hasta qué punto piensa que, que se mantendrían un poco? ¿A qué niveles llegarían de ese 0,8? Bueno, como has dicho, más objetos que añades, Uh, whether or you are lots of more data uh, to, to improve the classifier performance or you will got worse performance. But uh, since uh, we weren't uh, seeking for a, a specific uh, goal of, uh, computer of this computer vision system performance, we were just... Uh, in the end, what we are doing is uh, computer vision here is a tool to test other things like the interaction, like the active learning and, and so on. So. Once we got, uh, from the engineering point of view, what we did is, okay, we have uh, results that are good enough mm. for us, uh, let's go to the, to the other parts. I, we didn't think of uh, how much extrapolable is this for bigger data sets, but for sure, that might be an interesting future work, because uh, in the end, what we want is a robot operating in a real environment, mm. and we should uh, seek for, a, for, a, um, for a more realistic, or at least, more um, ambitious goals in, in, in the sense of, uh, of the computer vision system. Well, mis preguntas son un poco centradas en la percepción, no. <laughs> pero bueno, eh, <laughs> eso es innegable. innegable. Mm -hmm. eh, cuando se mezcla la información procedente de la cámara bueno, RGB o niveles de gris con la, con la obtenida con la estrategia de nubes de punto, eh, se emplea la fórmula 4.5 con el omega igual a 0.6. La verdad es que hay, no, no me termina de quedar clara o, eh, cómo se compaginan esos datos del todo, ¿no? O sea, en el sentido de que, por ejemplo, eh, pese a que a lo mejor eh, la estrategia basada en la nube de punto nos da unos resultados bajos, eh, realmente el, en la mezcla sube casi siempre, no siempre, alguna mm -hmm. hay, hay, me parece que con, con la calculadora, ca calculadora no sube, mm -hmm pero con los demás sí, mm -hmm. y eso también eh, va unido un poco eh, con los resultados obtenidos eh, eh, en la figura 6.4, que me parece la diapositiva 74, en la cuando eh, con, eh, con 20 vistas eh, cae bastante los datos, hay, 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 hay aspectos que la verdad es que no, no me he terminado de, de enterar por qué cae tanto, digamos, eh, los resultados basados en la nube de puntos, Mm -hmm. y, y cómo tampoco influyen tanto en el combinado mm, no me ha quedado claro la verdad lo siento yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, why it's uh, falling down this uh, or why is so low these uh, these results I think it's because of the resolution of the Kinect at the distance of the um, of at which we were uh, showing the object was around uh, one centimeter some yeah. some yeah. more or less So they are small objects, so sí. maybe here sí. we have some problems to, to distinguish and, and some parts of the objects uh, compare one to another, perhaps in the point cloud were quite similar. Mm. So that is our hypothesis why it's so low. Mm. The how this uh, combining uh, is made is uh, explained in, in, in the manuscript. Uh, what we're doing is 
we are averaging the, uh, the last 30 predictions, so uh, uh, one prediction for, per second for the um, RGB matcher and the point cloud matcher. So what we are doing is we have 60 predictions, and we are going giving some width, uh, weight to the this 60% uh, weight to the to the predictions of the of the um, RGB matcher and 40% to the predictions of the of the point cloud matcher. So what we are doing is. Uh, these pr 30 predictions, some of them might be wrong in the point cloud, some of them might be good. So what we're doing is disaggregated uh, 60 predictions per second. They yeah. are uh, used to decide uh, by an histogram, as, as uh, Professor Rodrigo has said, we do an histogram and the one with the higher frequency is the one that is decided. Vale, muchas gracias. Yes. Eh, bueno, pues nada más, eh, felicitarle a usted y a... a a sus directores por el trabajo realizado. Mm -hmm. eh, ¿Algún doctor desea realizar alguna intervención? Bueno, pues finalizam finalizamos es esta parte del acto. Mm -hmm. El tribunal se bueno, no se retira porque lo que se retira son los demás. Eh, <risa> <risa> los demás se retiran y el tribunal del de de piensa, delibera. delibera.